Good day to you. I will speak briefly about three points. One is something we're always talking about, about the right to apply sovereignty. It needs to be made clear, and we'll see in a moment why, that this is not a right only, it is an obligation, a duty. We as a state are creating no man's land around us, land without sovereignty. We are partners to the irresponsibility to the lack of sovereignty in Lebanon. We are partners to the lack of sovereignty in Sinai. We are partners to the weakening of sovereignty in general, that there is no one in charge, and lack of sovereignty is irresponsibility. There are people who live here, Jews and Arabs, and it's not like in other places in the world where states have applied sovereignty over lands that are not settled at all. Here we're talking about land where people live and there's no one in charge. No one is responsible for their lives. No one is responsible for the terrible situation they live in. I'm not talking about places like Peru. Chile, which occupied lands in Peru hundreds of years ago uh, simply for economic reasons because there, there are minerals that they want and applied sovereignty and to this day there is a land dispute and demands uh, that are seemingly justified by a country that was invaded and occupied simply because of the minerals there. And they applied sovereignty and they said, we'll continue the discussion from this point forward. There, uh, whether the, the demands are justified or not justified, we'll talk. They've been talking for over 120 years there. The, over who the sovereignty belongs to. But for the meantime, there is a sovereign there. There's someone in charge. Sovereignty is responsibility. And what we're seeing here in the lives of the Arabs that live there as well as the Jews, what we're seeing there is a lack of sovereignty which is expressed in irresponsibility. Irresponsibility for the development of infrastructures, a life of poverty and hardship, which is uh, the fate of both sides. And it doesn't matter what your opinion is. Uh, the fact is that there are Arabs, quite a few, who have this opinion. It doesn't matter whether what your opinion is. If you are a moral person, you should demand that there be someone in charge who will be in charge of this territory. And uh, any Arab you ask, if they uh, Arab who they want to be in charge, it's clear what they will say. And this, as I said, is our moral responsibility and not merely uh, our right. What we are often told when the subject of sovereignty comes up is what a blow it will be to our economy if we will have to be the ones in charge who invest in the development of infrastructures that are in a very poor condition now in these territories. There are a number of things we have to bear in mind when we're talking about economics. First of all, I have not found any serious research done on this subject, and I would expect that one of the human rights organizations would do some research on the economic implications of applying sovereignty and if they don't then we should but we can sketch out the guidelines of a program that will say what the cost what the uh, profit and loss balance will be uh, not in absolute terms it's true that it will be necessary to invest in Judea and Samaria a great deal in infrastructures. Uh, these investments are lacking in two areas, both in the Jewish settlements and in the Arab settlements. More in the Arab settlements, of course, but the transportation infrastructure and other infrastructures are lacking on both sides. This investment is huge. And that's why the left is uh, trying to scare us that even if we want to do this moral act of applying sovereignty, we will collapse economically. And that is not at all the case. Because if you do the balance, the right balance in economics, you have to examine three aspects 
which we always mention when we're talking about uh, economics. The first is human capital, the second is land, and the third is capital, money. If we examine these aspects from the point of view of human capital, we are wasting a very precious resource of people who don't have jobs, a very high unemployment rate, third world rate, and on the other hand, a state that is fighting a, a lack of working hands. We import workers and the demand of the various branches of the economy that demand these imports, construction and agriculture. And this comes from a place of pain. We are a developing a country that's developing very quickly and we don't have manpower. Today, the employment situation is among the best in the world. The unemployment in Israel is defined by economists as friction and in many industries there is a lack of working hands and we need to import like in Europe and in developing or rather developed countries we suffer from underemployment in Israel or rather a lack of employment in Israel and in our own backyard there are people who are unemployed who uh, need jobs desperately. That's the absurd situation that we are in. Uh, when you apply sovereignty and you give uh, poor people the, who don't have jobs the opportunity to work, we uh, are contributing about 10,000 shekels. I'm talking about minimum wage. We're talking about an income of uh, 10,000 shekels to the public coffers. A person who receives uh, minimum wage generates a an income of about 10,000 shekel per person to the state per month. I'm talking about month based on monthly wages, 120,000 a year. And that is the contribution of the state from every employee you see here in the area who has joined uh, the working population. That's a lot of money. When we talk about how much we're losing from the ultra-Orthodox population, we're also losing it from the Arab population. And here they their contribution doesn't let them live too well. They live much better than all other Arab countries in the region, but relative to the state of Israel, they live in poverty, and they could live on a much higher level without taking anything from us. On the contrary, they could l cause us added growth. I don't know why they're trying to scare us against applying sovereignty when we have a, a living example in China of a state that every month imports workers from its own territory, from the villages to the cities, and creates phenomenal growth, which in the world is considered uh, now low. It's only 8% a year, but for years it was 12 and 15% a year. All that growth was the result of the fact that they brought into the workforce people from the villages to the cities. We could do the exact same thing. We have people here who want to work. We're not giving them jobs for some reason. It's not related to any political dispute either. States have, for many reasons, various reasons, given up territories when they were sovereigns over that territory. And that's why even if a leftist has an opposite vision of ours and he wants to see a different state in part of our territories, morally it would be good for his vision to be realized, God forbid, but until that time this territory should be governed uh, morally in a way that would enable people to work, that it would enable the economy to flourish. It's beyond any political argument. That's the side of the human capital. Besides human capital, capital we said there are two additional aspects that should be taken into account. Land. It's clear that any calculation that the left does in order to, to show how s dangerous it is to apply sovereignty ignores a resource that is at our disposal, one that is available to us, that is in the most expensive area of the state, in the center of the country, 
which for a reason that no one can explain or will be able to explain to his grandchildren, people are crowding into areas in the Sharon area and don't allow themselves to settle five kilometers from there for mysterious unknown reasons. They pay a million shekels per dunam of land where they've decided that it's permitted to live and two kilometers away, they don't allow people to live in areas that are uh, in, in the highest demand in the center of the country. As I said, no serious economic research has been done, but any study that is done and that will have to take into account this uh, enormous part of the land of Israel that we have decided not to settle for some reason, what the economic implications would be of settling it, what it would do to the prices in the center of the country and the possibility of living in the land of Israel as a whole. And this third subject, which is capital, it is clear that human capital, if we foster it and lands that we settle in a revolution, a revolution of this kind would generate a revolution in uh, financial capital as well, which is currently in an intolerable situation among the Arab population in Judea and Samaria. And so it's clear that among the people, and I speak to economists in Judea and Samaria, and I have done so for many years, and they can say many things on the record and off the record, but it's clear that their aspiration is that we take responsibility and apply sovereignty and enable them to live the way that everyone should live under sovereignty and stop keeping these no man's lands around us which are uh, I I immoral and which harm our security and our future here. Thank you very much.